All right, let's do it. I'm excited, excited, excited that it is the holiday weekend. It's a big movie weekend. I think the studios really count on people going to the movies. And uh, we welcome in a guy who knows every kind of film. The, I mean, really, I'm talking about the comic book, the DC universe, the Marvel universe. Heard a great story about Stan Lee last night. I may get it into the mix in a future show. But uh, this guy also knows the subtitle movies, the, you know, the sophisticated stuff. He comes and goes on a rainbow. How about it for the great culture blaster, Michael Snyder? Here. And good afternoon, everybody. And here we are, mm -hmm. a couple of white guys hanging out on Black Friday. I uh, feel well, like... Uh, it's not that kind of black, but thank oh, you. Oh, okay. I, I, I feel like I should be out shopping instead of hanging out with you, but oh, it's okay. okay, baby. <laughs> yeah. What, by the way, uh, you've got to be buoyed by the 49ers. Oh, Lordy, that was a good game. And yeah. uh, it actually put a few demons to rest. A number of years ago, there was a Thanksgiving uh, game between the 49ers and and the Seahawks on the newly christened Levi Stadium. The Seahawks won, and in a moment of arrogance, uh, Richard Sherman, who was at that oh, point right. arch enemy uh, yeah. number one uh, as a member of the Seahawks, and uh, Russell Wilson, the uh, the Hobbit himself, ate turkey legs on the Niners logo. It drove people crazy. It so lovely to see the... I, um, is that a real thing or did you make it's that It's an up? absolute real I thing. I remember Sherman did something. Was no, it that? No, no. It was they ate the turkey legs on the 49er logo at the 50-yard line and people were in an uproar. So mm. how wonderful that the tables were turned and our stars gathered to chow down on turkey and as according to christian mccaffrey it was moist and delicious turkey he couldn't believe how they kept it warm and it was anyway uh, the, if you did watch the show um uh post game you saw that george kittle actually took the entire carcass uh, off the table on the field and brought it back to the locker room and on his way uh <laughs> He, oh, he, uh, heaved, he, heaved he, he heaved turkey wow. at the people. But what was really um, terrific, and boy, I don't like uh, Chris Collinsworth at all, but he did point out, he and Mike uh, Tirico pointed out that Brock Purdy and Debo were holding the turkey legs like Olympic torches, and these NBC broadcasters used it to promote the Olympics in <laughs> Paris, and they played the Olympic uh, theme as these guys were walking off holding up the turkey legs oh, to, the, to the fans. I thought it was uh, absolutely great. Uh, very, very funny and uh, good stuff. Well, welcome, uh, Culture Blaster. What do you have for us today? Well, I, I did want to say that I had a lovely Thanksgiving feast yesterday yeah. at an upscale Mexican restaurant. Yeah, yeah I, I went to Acapulco for Thanksgiving. Well, that was the name of the restaurant. I um, see. It was a delicious repast, traditional turkey and all the fixings, plus Mexican dishes. And I actually thought of Kim when I spotted a bowl of tortilla chip, chip, chips. Oh, oh I, I love it. We chip, had, chip, chip. Yeah. We had a crying baby in our group. And it's amazing when the crying baby is in your group, you kind of ignore it. And so I kept eating and people at surrounding tables were in an uproar. That, it was, it, oh, it sounds very nice. It Did was a really lovely uh, time. And, uh, I had a great time with uh, friends and family, and let's get to some movies. What do you say? Please, saying? please. Okay, let's start with Wish. As a Disney kid who grew up uh, and, and still love the classic movies, old and new, and, and I have a special affection for the Duck family, comics and cartoons, Donald Duck, Uncle Scrooge, and what yeah, have you. you know that stuff and like it. I wished Wish was a better movie. Oh, uh, no. It's about the power of wishes uh, as couched... Uh, uh, in a community whose citizens have heedlessly given the magic of their wishes to a wizardly ruler. Um, see, I'll ding heedlessly. That wizard, whose name is, get ready, King Magnifico, uh, promises to give up the rare wish to a specially chosen citizen uh, and make it come true for the wisher, even as he feeds off the energy of an entire country's worth of wishes. This is the, the premise. Okay. I see. Um, getting your wish realized is about as likely as winning the lottery, right? Uh, and that shows the nature of the king's abuse of his subjects. Um, I guess it's not bad. It's beautifully animated with quality voice acting from Ariana DuBose as the heroine. And since there are songs having this talented singer uh, belt them out it doesn't hurt one bit uh, she plays the heroine asha who wants to restore stolen wishes 
Uh, Chris Pine is the villainous but elegant King Magnifico, magically powered, a wish-consuming leader of the country of Rosas. And let's not ex uh, ignore the uh, requisite talking animals as if we could. Requisite. Uh, uh, and uh, an eminently marketable and cheerfully helpful celestial, celestial energy ball called Star, who comes from the heavens naturally some nice although perhaps overly familiar sounding show tunes and that glorious animation but it is clearly as much brand enhancement as a 100th anniversary celebration of the walt disney studios as it is a new movie it's to the point that the end credits actually feature a series of sparkly representations of virtually every significant animated disney feature from snow white and the seven dwarves uh, to Frozen and Kanto and Strange World. Uh, you know, it's pretty blatant. Other notable voice actors include Alan Tudyk, Victor Garber, Evan Peters, and Harvey Guillen. These are talented uh, performers, and they obviously bring their A-games. It's, you know, a prestige Disney production. Sure. Uh, Well-directed by Chris Buck and Fawn Versunthorn, uh, even if its visuals and its script by Jennifer Lee, Allison Moore, and Buck is so boilerplate and so full of Easter eggs, nods to Disney canon and motifs and references to timeless fairy tales and fables that one fears the specter of AI was somehow involved. I see. Like, like they downloaded the entire Disney library. And figured out ways to... And the know. complete Brothers Grimm into a program and said, give us a People <laughs> Please an animated feature to mark Disney's 100th anniversary. And that movie, for better or worse, is Wish. To reiterate, not bad, uh, but I preferred it when it was named... Okay, insert uh, title of your favorite Disney movie here. <laughs> I see. It just quacked like... Uh, a lot of other Disney fare. Uh, canon, I will ding in this context. Uh, well, you do you, Mark. Uh, um, but, it, all right. It's so, in theaters. Wish. In theaters. It, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, it, uh, I want so much more. So Kim could bring the family to Wish if she wanted to. If, if she wanted to, it, it'll be a good watch on Disney+. Plus. But it is not a, a great film. It is not a Disney classic, despite uh, being in the slot of the mm. 100th anniversary. How about... I'm so about, disappointed. I was yeah. really hoping it was going to be a good one. Turn it, her up a little bit, Albert, it, will you please? It's not or, or bad, maybe, maybe Kim. Not. It's, it's okay. not bad at all. But it's just not, you know, it's not all that. And maybe a bag you can of go, Kim, and you'll disagree with, uh, <laughs> uh, you know. Ch -ch -ch yeah, maybe you'll disagree with uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the no, Culture Blaster. Likely not. Mm -mm. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll see. So um, Culture Blaster, what about Napoleon? Okay. This is a big movie that I I'm curious know, about. I know. Seemingly intended as a kind of sprawling survey of a legendary life, uh, Napoleon comes to the screen, big and eventually small, um, from veteran director Ridley Scott. Okay, wow. this guy, Gladiator, Alien, Thelma and Louise, Blade Runner, and The Martian are just a few highlights of his career. Uh, so he teams with screenwriter David Scarpa to tell the tale, ostensibly tell the tale of Napoleon. Ostensibly. Uh, it runs two hours and 28 minutes, and it's set uh, in a meticulously produced late 18th and early 19th century uh, France and, and Europe in general. So that's done very well. You're Beautiful. Saying. Meticulously. Uh, uh, the cinematography is gorgeous with elaborate and expertly executed battle scenes and significant historical incidents recreated. You get kind of terse and sometimes droll, amusing moments of intimacy between the Corsican-born French army officer who would conquer much of Europe uh, and become Emperor of France, Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, droll is a ding word. So he's the nominal central figure of the movie, and he's there. You see him with his wife, Josephine, or his colleagues in the government and military. Who plays Josephine? Well, uh, we'll get to that, because right. we haven't mentioned uh, Joaquin Phoenix, who plays Napoleon. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, the actors in the leads, uh, Phoenix and Vanessa Kirby, as Josephine, are no slouches. Although, you know, Phoenix doesn't seem to be of the period. Oh, and that's interesting. I, I, you know, I felt him to be a little light on the preternatural forcefulness and wow. gravitas needed to play such a preternatural, powerful gravitas. and driven person. Mm -hmm. And while Phoenix comes off as kind of short in these respects, he never appears as short as we're always told the real man was. So I'm How watching. How was Napoleon? Do you know? I, I don't know, know, but I'm watching it thinking, where's the Napoleon complex? <laughs> I know how. How? But wait a minute. I'm asking all of you in the chat. How tall was Napoleon? It's a Mark Thompson time waster, it's a ladies classic and gentlemen. Classic Mark Thompson time waster. We do these during Snyder. Do you know Kim? Do you know how tall 
Napoleon was. He's got this reputation, and Snyder's just done it, taking a shot about how short he was. I'm going to say 5'3". Five, 5'3", three. Five, three is the guess from Kim. Anybody in the chat want to take a guess? I will give you a few seconds to try to guess how tall Napoleon was. 5'7", says Kathleen Bryant. 5'6", says shadow producer Calvin Wong, and he is right. 5'6", oh, is the answer. That is not so short, so we've been misled That's over the years. That's exactly why I asked the question. It's not, he wasn't super short. But anyway, go ahead. Anyway, he was complex. But anyway, uh, yes. Uh, as <laughs> for the it. rest of the cast, it's fine. In fact, uh, Ben Miles from Andor, The Crown and Coupling, Tahir Rahim, so amazing in The Serpent, and Francis Ludovine Seigne of numerous significant French movies and the recent TV series Lupin. All actors I admire are among the supporting players. Yet when it was over... I, I felt a little numb as much as I appreciated a, a number of its epic moments as played out on the IMAX screen where I saw it. Wow. I just, bet it's spectacular. I felt IMAX. that it never really let me know what made Napoleon tick, what drove his hunger for power, uh, although it does suggest that trying to hold on to um, Josephine and hold sway over her when she seemed to have him kind of wrapped around her finger was maybe a motivator of sorts. Uh, and the occasional uh, silliness... Uh, in the dialogue and some of the interplay that Napoleon has doesn't so much humanize the character as create shifting tones that undermine the movie's coherence. Uh, again, it's a movie about the Emperor Napoleon, his battlefield exploits, and his great love for Josephine, and it seems to lack gravitas, or, or maybe it hopes to find it in explicitly violent, bloody action sequences, which are there in spades as lengthy as the movie is we're never shown much of his early life which might have offered more clarity about him uh, although it's linear and kind of chronological in its portrayal of the rise and fall of napoleon it, it kind of felt like stuff was missing so as prodigious achievements go scott's napoleon looks like one and many of the pieces are impressive in an isolated way and, and to be fair Scott says that there's a longer miniseries version of this Napoleon that may show up on Apple Plus, um, whose studio is one of the production entities behind the movie, which suggests that what's in theaters now is an edited down version of the project. And if that's the case and the whole thing is made available, I will watch the whole thing, despite my quibbles about the feature film. Wow, wow. Uh, you know it's in theaters in multiple formats, including 70 millimeter and, as mentioned, IMAX. And if you are going to see it in the theater, go see it in one of those big formats because it visually is stunning. Kim? You know who liked this movie, apparently? The French. It had a huge opening in France. Uh, took in a one point. 1.019 million from 120,000 tickets sold opening day on Wednesday. There's so never been France, anything like this. They yeah. wanted to go see it. <laughs> Let's be straight up about this, Kim. If it was a movie about Maurice Chevalier, it also would have done really, really well. The French <laughs> love their own, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Something oh, wow. something that's far more my speed than Wish or Napoleon. And again, I went into both of those thinking, oh, man, I'm excited. Yeah, you were excited about both. Both yeah. of them. Uh, Salt Burn, uh, the darkly humorous and a cheerfully perverse follow-up to the Oscar-winning filmmaker Emerald Fennel's similarly twisted and compelling movie Promising Young Woman, which you may recall starred Carrie Mulligan as a woman who uh, is abused by men and becomes a sort of avenging angel. So Saltburn is sort of the flip side to Promising Young Woman. In Saltburn, Oliver Quick, a nebbishy student at posh Oxford University, a place you know, Mr. Thompson. Yes. That's I'm, why I'm wearing this Rhodes T-shirt today, by the way. Oh, I'm, very I'm, impressive. Yes, yes I well. was educated at Ox Oxford. Uh, partially. Uh, anyway, um, he, he uh, this guy Oliver becomes enamored of a wealthy golden boy type uh, named Felix Catton, and Oliver, played by Barry Keegan, who always plays these freaks and geeks in movies like The Killing of the Sacred Deer, The Banshees of Inishirin, The Batman. He's like, at the very end of the uh, recent Batman movie, he's the Joker. So this guy is quite at home playing weirdos and misfits. Um, he's doing his best to be accepted, uh, the Oliver character, uh, to be accepted by Felix, who was played by Jacob Elordi, by the way, a guy on the rise, most recently playing Elvis in the Priscilla movie. And uh, the ploys by Oliver work. When the semester ends, Felix invites Oliver to join him and his aristocratic family at their lavish estate, Saltburn, for the entire summer. So the family includes, get ready, 
Rosamund Pike and Richard E. Grant as Felix's mother and father, Elsbeth and Sir James. I love those actors. Uh, Alice and Oliver as Felix's sister, Venetia. Uh, Archie uh, Medequi as Farley Start, who is Felix's American cousin. Paul Reese as Duncan, Saltburn's butler. And Carrie Mulligan reuniting with Fennel as Pamela, uh, an eccentric friend of the Cattens. It's like she's channeling Helena Bonham Carter. I'm like, wow, is that Helena Bonham oh, Carter? Yeah. No, it was Carrie Mulligan. Anyway, um, some of them are wrapped up in their uh, hedonistic pursuits. Some are suspicious of Oliver, even as Felix and his mother appear to welcome the misfit. Um, as the uh, sniping and sarcasm and the uh, regular behavior of the rich and feckless ramp up, uh, salt burns, um, the estate starts to feel like a powder keg with the, a lit and ever-shortening fuse. And Saltburn, the movie, gets ever more cutting in its takedown of the class system, uh, profligate lifestyles, profligate. social climbers, and general moral decay. Keegan, like I said, is no stranger to playing uh, weirdos, and he's equal parts riveting and disturbing as Oliver. He'd be reason enough to see the movie, but the other characters are so well-defined and performed by the rest of the cast, and the writing in general is so sharp that Saltburn almost burns itself into your consciousness wow. as you watch it, and the burn. You know, kind of like the hotter dishes at Brandy Hose in North Beach or Jitlada in Hollywood may make you sweat, but it also may trigger endorphins or at least give you a bracing shock to the system. Uh, salt burn is in theaters. Wow. So of the three, the, the two that you thought you'd really love, you're not in love with, well, but, but salt burn is the one that really pinned the meter for you. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have a chance to talk about it last week, and I'll just say quickly, The Stones and Brian Jones is a really worthwhile documentary about the guy who actually started the Rolling Stones and was the initial sex symbol before Mick Jagger as the front man began to uh, lap him in a lot of ways, and he became increasingly caught up in uh, drugs and self-abuse. Uh, uh, Brian Jones, very talented musician, uh, and the great documentarian Nick Broomfield has made a pretty cool documentary with archival footage and, and stuff I'd never seen before uh, about Brian Jones's relationship to the Rolling Stones, his early life, and uh, his tragic demise and i highly recommend it it's available on many streaming outlets uh the, the stones and brian jones wow so to review for those of you who um are just joining us i would encourage you if you are just joining us to go back and listen to the entire review but the stones and brian jones you just heard michael likes it as a documentary to remind us of brian jones and how he fit into the stones and who the stones were and became he, fa he founded the group. Oh, is that right? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I need to see it because I don't know a whole bunch about the Stones. Um, Saltburn, the darkly humorous offering with Oliver Quick and Barry Keegan and Rosamund Pike and Carrie Mulligan. Michael really liked it. Yeah, Keegan plays Oliver Quick, who is this guy who just wants to worm his oh, way I'm sorry. into, so the, Keegan plays into Quick. the aristocracy, you know, a modest fellow. I get it. All right, thank you. I, I'm sure my, you're you're suffering from post-Thanksgiving. My notes are a bit confusing yeah, on yeah, everything. That's fine. Napoleon, um, the Ridley Scott movie, looks amazing. Michael encourages you to see it in the biggest, baddest way you can. Joaquin Phoenix... Somehow, I think Joaquin Phoenix may be the greatest actor of his generation or among them, but somehow you were left a little empty on this one, Michael. It's yeah, a, it just it's sca it feels scattered. All right. It's a lot to take on, to be fair, Napoleon. Vanessa Kirby is also in it. Not Remember the first three letters of Napoleon spell nap. <laughs> and, and so... <laughs> I mean, so I, I'm it, not saying I was dozing off. There's explosions and, yeah. and cannonballs. It is long, it the, is uh, long, the movie. It is. Uh, but you did like it. It's just that you didn't I love it. I admired it more than liked oh, it. Oh, interesting. Okay. All right. And then Wish is how we started the Disney offering with Chris Pine and a bunch of other big stars. He actually said, hey, the, the, the stars were good. The performances are really great. Looks beautiful. Looks gorgeous. It's just that the substance of what the movie is is a little feeling uh not special trying to feel warmed over it's yeah. a very thanksgiving 
uh, yeah. day after Thanksgiving morning. Kind exactly. Of. It's a yeah. movie of leftovers. And in fact, there is even a moment, you know, the Disney logo where Tinkerbell flies over the castle. Sure. They even basically reproduce that with this little star creature. And I'm like, could you be more blatant? I felt like Chandler <laughs> Bing. I'm sitting there. Going, oh my God. Uh, well, that's a good, that's a good list. You've done the Lord's work here today. Uh, Kim, do you have any final remarks or questions for Michael before I excuse the witness? I think Kim, Kim left for the after party live. Oh, I see her there in, uh, that must be her computer or something. No. Then that's, that's cold, Kim. How that's dare cold. her? Yeah. Ch -ch -ch I really do. You know what I'm going to do? What I'm going to stay here. And when the after party lives over, I'm going to make her listen to your entire segment again and remark on it publicly. That's fine. I mean, I introduced her as a supporting player. I'm sorry. In the course of the I'm segment. It's outrageous. I know. It really is outrageous. Well, is that any way to treat someone on a holiday exactly. weekend? Exactly. Thanksgiving. Not even enough to give thanks to hang out. What time is it? I guess she had to leave. It's yeah. one yeah. of uh, You know, uh, we don't have enough time to talk about Monarch Legacy of Monsters yeah, on Apple TV. But, I don't know what the hell they yeah. do it for. <laughs> but we will talk about it next week. I uh, hope we can fit it in then because it's. Uh, I'm enjoying uh, the series. We're going to get you on even earlier next time so you can uh, have more time to breathe. I, I also want to say before we go, Jim Avila, best of everything. You have been such an asset to yeah, this program. That's true. Uh, I go out of my way to check out your segments, uh, and I wish you nothing but success and and happiness in the new gig and and can you come back and talk about non-sectarians things that aren't specifically oh, yeah. uh, uh you know editorial on your part just talk about the hard news remember when newscasters talked about the hard news remember that <laughs> and didn't have an opinion michael we love you go niners Woo! comes and goes on a rainbow bye michael have a great weekend everybody yeah right on hi it's mark and i thought that was great Hit the notification bell, you'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.